Hello friends and welcome to the conclusion of this calm reading of Little Women. Tonight I shall be reading for you chapter 46, Under the Umbrella, as well as chapter 47, Harvest Time. Before we begin, let us find a place where we can unwind. Settle into that place. Take a deep breath. And let us get lost in these chapters. Chapter 46 Under the Umbrella While Laurie and Amy were taking conjugal strolls over velvet carpets, as they set the house in order and planned a blissful future, Mr. Bear and Joe were enjoying promenades of a different sort, along muddy roads and sodden fields. I always do take a walk toward evening, and I don't know why I should give it up, just because I happened to meet the professor on his way out, said Joe to herself after two or three encounters, for though there were two paths to Meg's, whichever one she took, she was sure to meet him either going or returning. He was always walking rapidly, and never seemed to see her until quite close, when he would look as if his short-sighted eyes had failed to recognize the approaching lady till that moment. Then, if she was going to Meg's, he always had something for the babies. If her face was turned homeward, he had merely strolled down to see the river, and was just returning, unless they were tired of his frequent calls. Under the circumstances, what could Joe do but greet him civilly, and invite him in? If she was tired of his visits, she concealed her weariness with perfect skill, and took care that there should be coffee for supper. As Friedrich, I mean Mr. Bear, doesn't like tea. But the second week, everyone knew perfectly well what was going on. Yet everyone tried to look as if they were stone blind to the changes in Joe's face. They never asked why she sang about her work, did up her hair three times a day, and got so blooming with her evening exercises and no one seemed to have the slightest suspicion that Professor Bear, while talking philosophy with the father, was giving the daughter lessons in love. Jo couldn't even lose her heart in a decorous manner, but sternly tried to quench her feelings, and failed to do so, led a somewhat agitated life. She was morally afraid of being laughed at, for surrendering, after her many and vehement declarations of independence. Laurie was her especial dread, but thanks to the new manager, he behaved with praiseworthy propriety, never called Mr. Bear a capital old fellow in public, never alluded in the remotest manner to Joe's improved appearance or expressed the least surprise at seeing the professor's hat on the marcher's table nearly every evening. But he exulted in private, and longed for the time to come, when he could give Joe a piece of plate, with a bear and a ragged staff on it, as an appropriate coat of arms. For a fortnight the professor came and went, with lover-like regularity. Then he stayed away for three whole days, and made no sign, a proceeding which caused everybody to look sober, and Joe to become pensive at first, and then, alas for romance, very cross. Disgusted, I dare say, and gone home as suddenly as he came, 
It's nothing to me, of course, but I should think he would have come and bid us good-bye like a gentleman, she said to herself, with a despairing look at the gate. As she put on her things for the customary walk one dull afternoon. You'd better take the little umbrella, dear. It looks like rain, said her mother, observing that she had on her bonnet, but not alluding to the fact. Yes, Marmy, do you want anything in town? I've got to run in and get some paper, returned Joe, pulling out the bow under her chin before the glass as an excuse for not looking at her mother. Yes, I want some twilled silesia, a paper of number nine needles, and two yards of narrow lavender ribbon. Have you got your thick boots on, and something warm under your cloak? I believe so, answered Joe absently. If you happen to meet Mr. Bear, bring him home to tea. I quite long to see the dear man, added Mrs. March. Joe heard that but made no answer, except to kiss her mother and walk rapidly away, thinking with a glow of gratitude in spite of her heartache. How good she is to me! What do girls do who haven't any mothers to help them through their troubles? The dry goods stores were not down among the counting houses, banks, and wholesale warerooms, where gentlemen most do congregate but she found herself in that part of the city before she did a single errand, loitering along, as if waiting for someone, examining engineering instruments in one window and samples of wool in another, with most unfeminine interest, tumbling over barrels, being half smothered by descending bales, and hustled unceremoniously by busy men who looked as if they wandered how the deuce she got there. A drop of rain on her cheek recalled her thoughts from baffled hopes to ruined ribbons. For the drops continued to fall, and being a woman as well as a lover, she felt that, though it was too late to save her heart, she might her bonnet. Now she remembered the little umbrella which she had forgotten to take in her hurry to be off but regret was unavailing, and nothing could be done but borrow one, or submit to a trenching. She looked up at the lowering sky, down at the crimson bow already flecked with black, forward along the muddy street, then one long, lingering look behind, at a certain grimy warehouse, with Hoffman, Schwartz, and company over the door, and said to herself, with a sternly reproachful air. It serves me right. What business had I to put on all my best things and come philandering down here, hoping to see the professor? Joe, I am ashamed of you. No, you shall not go there and borrow an umbrella, or find out where he is, from his friends. You shall drudge away and do your errands in the rain. And if you catch your death and ruin your bonnet, it is no more than you deserve. Now then. With that, she rushed across the street so impetuously that she narrowly escaped annihilation from a passing truck and precipitated herself into the arms of a stately old gentleman who said, I beg pardon, ma'am, and looked mortally offended. Somewhat daunted, Joe righted herself, spread a handkerchief over the devoted ribbons, and putting temptation behind her, hurried on, with increasing dampness about the ankles, and much clashing of umbrellas overhead. The fact that the somewhat dilapidated blue one remained stationary above the unprotected bonnet attracted her attention, and, looking up, she saw Mr. Bear looking down. I feel to know the strong-minded lady who goes so bravely under many horse noses, and so fast through much mud. What do you down here, my friend? I'm shopping. 
Mr. Bear smiled as he glanced from the pickle factory on one side to the wholesale hide and leather concern on the other. But he only said politely, You have no umbrella. May I go also and take for you the bundles? Yes, thank you. Joe's cheeks were as red as her ribbon, and she wondered what he thought of her. But she didn't care, for in a minute she found herself walking away arm in arm with her professor, feeling as if the sun had suddenly burst out with uncommon brilliancy, that the world was all right again, and that one thoroughly happy woman was paddling through the wet that day. We thought you had gone, said Joe hastily, for she knew he was looking at her. Her bonnet wasn't big enough to hide her face. And she feared he might think the joy it betrayed unmaidenly. Did you believe that I should go with no farewell to those who have been so heavenly kind to me? He asked so reproachfully that she felt as if she had insulted him by the suggestion and answered heartily. No, I didn't. I knew you were busy about your own affairs, but we rather missed you, father and mother especially. And you? I'm always glad to see you, sir. In her anxiety to keep her voice quite calm, Joe made it rather cool, and the frosty little monosyllable at the end seemed to chill the professor for his smile vanished, as he said gravely. I thank you, and come one more time before I go. You are going, then? I have no longer any business here. It is done. Successfully, I hope, said Joe, for the bitterness of disappointment was in that short reply of his. I ought to think so, for I have a way open to me by which I can make my bread and give my younglings much help. Tell me, please, I like to know all about the... the boys, said Joe eagerly. And that is so kind, I gladly tell you. My friends find me a place in a college, where I teach as at home and earn enough to make the very smooth for Franz and Emil. For this I should be grateful, should I not? Indeed you should. How splendid it will be to have you doing what you like, and be able to see you often, and the boys, cried Joe, clinging to the lads as an excuse for the satisfaction she could not help betraying. Ah, but we shall not meet often, I fear, this place is at the west. So far away, and Joe left her skirts to their fate, as if it didn't matter now what became of her clothes or herself. Mr. Bear could read several languages, but he had not learned to read women yet. He flattered himself that he knew Joe pretty well, and was, therefore, much amazed by the contradictions of voice, face, and manner, which she showed him in rapid succession that day, for she was in half a dozen different moods in the course of half an hour. When she met him she looked surprised, though it was impossible to help suspecting that she had come for that express purpose. When he offered her his arm, she took it with a look that filled him with delight, but when he asked if she missed him, she gave such a chilly, formal reply that despair fell upon him. On learning his good fortune, she almost clapped her hands. Was the joy all for the boys? And then, on hearing his destination, she said, So far away, in a tone of despair that lifted him onto a pinnacle of hope. But the next minute she tumbled him down again by observing like one entirely absorbed in the matter. Here's the place for my errands. Will you come in? It won't take long. 
Jo rather prided herself upon her shopping capabilities, and particularly wished to impress her escort with the neatness and dispatch with which she would accomplish the business. But owing to the flutter she was in, everything went amiss. She upset the tray of needles, forgot that the Cilicia was to be twilled till it was cut off, gave the wrong change, and covered herself with confusion by asking for lavender ribbon at the calico counter. Mr. Beer stood by, watching her blush and blunder, and as he watched, his own bewilderment seemed to subside, for he was beginning to see that on some occasions women like dreams go by contraries. When they came out, he put the parcel under his arm with a more cheerful aspect, and splashed through the puddles as if he rather enjoyed it on the whole. Should we not do a little what you call shopping for the babies, and half a farewell feast tonight, if I go for my last call at your so pleasant home? He asked, stopping before a window full of fruit and flowers. What will we buy? asked Joe, ignoring the latter part of his speech, and sniffing the mingled odors with an affection of delight as they went in. May they have oranges and figs? asked Mr. Bear with a partial air. They eat them when they can get them. Do you care for nuts? Like a squirrel. Hamburg grapes? Yes, we shall drink to the fatherland in those. Joe frowned upon that piece of extravagance, and asked why he didn't buy a frail of dates, a cask of raisins and a bag of almonds, and be done with it, whereat Mr. Bear confiscated her purse, produced his own, and finished the marketing by buying several pounds of grapes, a pot of rosy daisies, and a pretty jar of honey, to be regarded in the light of a demijohn. Then, distorting his pockets with knobby bundles, and giving her the flowers to hold, he put up the old umbrella, and they travelled on again. Miss Marsh, I have a great favour to ask of you, began the professor, after a moist promenade of half a block. Yes, sir, and Joe's heart began to beat so hard, she was afraid he would hear it. I am bold to say it in spite of the rain, because so short a time remains to me. Yes, sir. And Joe nearly crushed the small flower pot with the sudden squeeze she gave it. I wish to get a little dress for my Tina, and I am too stupid to go alone. Will you kindly give me a word of taste and help? Yes, sir and Jo felt as calm and cool all of a sudden as if she had stepped into a refrigerator. Perhaps also a shawl for Tina's mother. She is so poor and sick, and the husband is such a care. Yes, yes, a thick, warm shawl would be a friendly thing to take the little mother. I'll do it with pleasure, Mr. Bear. I'm going very fast, as he's getting dearer every minute added Joe to herself. Then, with a mental shake, she entered into the business with an energy that was pleasant to behold. Mr. Bear left it all to her, so she chose a pretty gown for Tina, and then ordered out the shawls. The clerk, being a married man, condescended to take an interest in the couple, who appeared to be shopping for their family. Your lady may prefer this. It's a superior article. A most desirable collar, quite chaste and genteel, he said, shaking out a comfortable grey shawl and throwing it over Joe's shoulders. Does this suit you, Mr. Bear? she asked, turning her back to him and feeling deeply grateful for the chance of hiding her face. Excellently well. We will have it answered the professor, 
smiling to himself as he paid for it. While Joe continued to rummage the countess like a confirmed bargain hunter. Now shall we go home? he asked, as if the words were very pleasant to him. Yes, it's late, and I am so tired. Joe's voice was more pathetic than she knew. For now, the sun seemed to have gone in as suddenly as it came out, and the world grew muddy and miserable again and for the first time she discovered that her feet were cold, her head ached, and that her heart was colder than the former, fuller of pain than the latter. Mr. Bear was going away. He only cared for her as a friend. It was all a mistake. And the sooner it was over, the better. With this idea in her head, she hailed an approaching omnibus with such a hasty gesture that the daisies flew out of the pot and were badly damaged. This is not our omnibus, said the professor, waving the loaded vehicle away, and stopping to pick up the poor little flowers. I beg your pardon, I didn't see the name distinctly. Never mind, I can walk. I'm used to plodding in the mud, returned Joe, winking hard because she would have died rather than openly wipe her eyes. Mr. Bear saw the drops on her cheeks, though she turned her head away. The sight seemed to touch him very much, for suddenly, stooping down, he asked in a tone that meant a great deal, Hearts dearest, why do you cry? Now, if Joe had not been new to this sort of thing, she would have said she wasn't crying, had a cold in her head, or told any other feminine fib proper to the occasion. Instead of which, that undignified creature answered with an irresponsible sob, Because you are going away. Ach, mein Gott, that is so good cried Mr. Bear, managing to clasp his hands in spite of the umbrella and the bundles. Joe, I have nothing but much love to give you. I came to see if you could care for it, and I waited to be sure that I was something more than a friend. Am I? Can you make a little place in your heart for old Fritz? He added, all in one breath. Oh, yes, said Joe and he was quite satisfied, for she folded both hands over his arm, and looked up at him, with an expression that plainly showed how happy she would be to walk through life beside him, even though she had no better shelter than the old umbrella, if he carried it. It was certainly proposing under difficulties, for even if he had desired to do so, Mr. Bear could not go down upon his knees on account of the mud. Neither could he offer Joe his hand, except figuratively, for both were full. Much less could be indulged in tender remonstrations in the open street, though he was near it. So the only way in which he could express his rapture was to look at her, with an expression which glorified his face to such a degree that there actually seemed to be little rainbows in the drops that sparkled on his beard. If he had not loved Joe very much, I don't think he could have done it then, for she looked far from lovely, with her skirts in a deplorable state, her rubber boots splashed to the ankle, and her bonnet a ruin. Fortunately, Mr. Bear considered her the most beautiful woman living and she found him more Jove-like than ever, though his hat-brim was quite limp, with the little rills trickling thence upon his shoulders, for he held the umbrella all over Joe, and every finger of his gloves needed mending. Passers-by probably thought them a pair of harmless lunatics, for they entirely forgot to hail a bus, and strolled leisurely along, oblivious of deepening dusk and fog, 
Little they cared what anybody thought, for they were enjoying the happy hour that seldom comes but once in any life. The magical moment which bestows youth on the old, beauty on the plain, wealth on the poor, and gives human hearts a foretaste of heaven. The professor looked as if he had conquered a kingdom, and the world had nothing more to offer him in the way of bliss. While Joe trudged beside him, feeling as if her place had always been there, and wondering how she ever could have chosen any other lot. Of course, she was the first to speak, intelligibly, I mean, for the emotional remarks which followed her impetuous, oh yes, were not of a coherent or reportable character. Friedrich, why didn't you? Ah, heavens, she gives me the name that no one speaks since Minna died, cried the professor pausing in a puddle to regard her with grateful delight. I always call you so to myself. I forgot, but I won't unless you like it. Like it? It is more sweet to me than I can tell. Say thou also, and I shall say your language is almost as beautiful as mine. Isn't thou a little sentimental? asked Joe privately thinking it a lovely monosyllable. A sentimental, yes, thank God. We Germans believe in sentiment and keep ourselves young minded. Your English you is so cold. Say thou, heart's dearest, it means so much to me, pleaded Mr. Bear, more like a romantic student than a grave professor. Well, then, why didn't thou tell me all this sooner? asked Joe bashfully. Now I shall have to show thee all my heart, and so gladly will, because thou must take care of it hereafter. See, then, my Joe, ah, the dear, funny little name. I had a wish to tell something the day I said good-bye in New York, but I thought the handsome friend was betrothed to thee, and so I spoke not. Would thou have said yes, then, if I had spoken? I don't know, I'm afraid not, for I didn't have any heart just then. But that I do not believe. It was asleep till the fairy prince came through the wood, and waked it up. Ah, well, the erste Liebe is the beste, but that I should not expect. Yes, the first love is the best, but be so contented, for I never had another. Teddy was only a boy, and soon got over his little fancy, said Joe, anxious to correct the professor's mistake. Good, then I shall rest happy, and be sure that thou givest me all. I have waited so long, I am grown selfish, as thou wilt find, Professorin. I like that, cried Joe, delighted with her new name. Now tell me what brought you, at last, just when I wanted you. This, and Mr. Bear took a little worn paper out of his waistcoat pocket. Joe unfolded it and looked much abashed, for it was one of her own contributions to a paper that paid for poetry, which accounted for her sending it an occasional attempt. How could that bring you? she asked, wondering what he meant. I found it by chance. I knew it by the names and the initials, and in it there was one little verse that seemed to call me, read and find him. I will see that you will not go in the vet. In the garret. Four little chests, all in a row, dim with dust and worn by time all fashioned and filled, long ago. By children, now in their prime, four little keys hung side by side, with faded ribbons, brave and gay, when fastened there with childish pride, long ago, on a rainy day. Four little names, one on each lid, carved out by a boyish hand, and underneath there lieth hid, 
histories of the happy band, once playing here and pausing oft, to hear the sweet refrain that came and went on the roof aloft in the falling summer rain. Meg on the first lid, smooth and fair, I look in with loving eyes, for folded here with well-known care, a goodly gathering lies. The record of a peaceful life, gifts to gentle child and girl, a bridal gown lines to a wife, a tiny shoe, a baby curl. No toys in this first chest remain, for all are carried away, in the old age to join again, in another small Meg's play. Ah, happy mother, well I know you hear like a sweet refrain, lullabies ever soft and low in the falling summer rain. Joe on the next lid, scratched and worn, and within a motley store, of headless dolls, of school books torn, birds and beasts that speak no more. Spoils brought home from the fairy ground, only trod by youthful feet. Dreams of a future never found, memories of a past still sweet. Half-read poems, stories wild, April letters warm and cold. Diaries of a willful child, hints of a woman early old. A woman in a lonely home, hearing like a sad refrain. Be worthy, love, and love will come in the falling summer rain. My Beth, the dust is always swept from the lid that bears your name, as if by loving eyes that wept, by careful hands that often came, death canonized for us one saint, ever less human than divine, and still we lay with tender plaint, relics in this household shrine, the silver bell so seldom rung, the little cap which last she wore, the fair dead Catherine that hung, by angels born above her door. The song she sang without lament in her prison house of pain, forever are they sweetly blent with the falling summer rain. Upon the last lid's polished field, legend now both fair and true, a gallant knight bears on his shield, Amy, in letters gold and blue. Within lie snoots that bound her hair, slippers that have danced at the last, faded flowers laid by with care, fans whose airy toils are past, gay valentines all ardent flames, trifles that have borne their part in girlish hopes and fears and shames, the record of a maiden heart. Now, learning fairer, truer spells, hearing like a blithe refrain the silver sound of bridal bells in the falling summer rain. Four little chests all in a row, dim with dust and worn by time, four women taught by weal and woe to love and labor in their prime. Four sisters parted for an hour, none lost, one only gone before, made by love's immortal power, nearest and dearest evermore. Oh, when these hidden stores of ours lie open to the Father's sight, may they be rich in golden hours, deeds that show fairer for the light. Lives whose brave music long shall ring, like a spirit stirring strain, souls that shall gladly soar and sing in the long sunshine after rain. It's very bad poetry, but I felt it when I wrote it, one day when I was very lonely, and had a good cry on a ragbag. I never thought it would go where it could tell tales, said Joe tearing up the verses the professor had treasured so long. Let it go. It has done its duty, 
and I will have a fresh one when I read all the brown book in which she keeps her little secrets, said Mr. Bear with a smile as he watched the fragments fly away on the wind. Yes, he added earnestly. I read that, and I think to myself she has a sorrow. She is lonely. She would find comfort in true love. I have a heart full, full for her. Shall I not go and say, if this is not too poor a thing to give, for what I shall hope to receive, take it in God's name? And so you came to find that it was not too poor, but the one precious thing I needed, whispered Joe. I had no courage to think that at first, heavenly kind as was your welcome to me. But soon I began to hope, and then I said, I will have her if I die for it, and so I will, cried Mr. Bear with a defiant nod. As if the walls of mist closing round them were barriers which he was to surmount or valiantly knock down. Joe thought that was splendid, and resolved to be worthy of her knight though he did not come prancing on a charger in gorgeous array. "'What made you stay away so long?' she asked presently, finding it so pleasant to ask confidential questions and get delightful answers that she could not keep silent. "'It was not easy, but I could not find the heart to take you from that so happy home until I could have a prospect of one to give you. After much time, perhaps, and hard work. How could I ask you to give up so much for a poor old fellow, who has no fortune but a little learning? I'm glad you're poor. I couldn't bear a rich husband, said Joe decidedly, adding in a softer tone, Don't fear poverty. I've known it long enough to lose my dread and be happy working for those I love. And don't call yourself old. Forty is the prime of life. I couldn't help loving you if you were seventy. The professor found that so touching that he would have been glad of his handkerchief if he could have got at it. As he couldn't, Joe wiped his eyes for him and sat laughing as she took away a bundle or two. I may be strong-minded, but no one can say I am out of sphere now, for women's special mission is supposed to be drying tears and bearing burdens. I am to carry my share, Friedrich, and help to earn the home. Make up your mind to that, or I'll never go, she added resolutely as he tried to reclaim his load. We shall see. Have you patience to wait a long time, Joe? I must go away and do my work alone. I must help my boys first, because, even for you, I may not break my word to Minna. Can you forgive that, and be happy while we hope and wait? Yes, I know I can, for we love one another, and that makes all the rest easy to bear. I have my duty, also, and my work. I couldn't enjoy myself if I neglected them, even for you so there's no need of hurry or impatience. You can do your part out west. I can do mine here, and both be happy hoping for the best, and leaving the future to be as God wills. Ah, thou givest me such hope and courage, and I have nothing to give back but a full heart and these empty hands, cried the professor, quite overcome. Joe, never never would learn to be proper, for when he said that, as they stood upon the steps, she just put both hands into his, whispering tenderly, Not empty now, and stooping down, kissed her Friedrich under the umbrella. It was dreadful, but she would have done it if the flock of draggle-tailed sparrows on the hedge had been human beings for she was very far gone indeed, and quite regardless of everything but her own happiness, though it came in such a very simple guise. 
That was the crowning moment of both their lives, when turning from the night and storm and loneliness to the household light and warmth and peace, waiting to receive them. With a glad, welcome home, Joe let her lover in and shut the door. Chapter 47 Harvest Time For a year, Joe and her professor worked and waited, hoped and loved, met occasionally, and wrote such voluminous letters that the rise in the price of paper was accounted for, Laurie said. The second year began rather soberly, for the prospects did not brighten, and Aunt March died suddenly. But when their first sorrow was over, for they loved the old lady in spite of her sharp tongue, they found they had cause for rejoicing, for she had left Plumfield to Joe, which made all sorts of joyful things possible. It's a fine old place, and will bring a handsome sum, for of course you intend to sell it, said Laurie, as they were all talking the matter over some weeks later. No, I don't, was Joe's decided answer, as she patted the fat poodle, whom she had adopted out of respect to his former mistress. You don't mean to live there? Yes, I do. But, my dear girl, it's an immense house, and will take a power of money to keep it in order. The garden and orchard alone need two or three men, and farming isn't in Bear's line, I take it. He'll try his hand at it there, if I propose it. And you expect to live on the produce of the place? Well, that sounds paradisical, but you'll find it desperate hard work. The crop we are going to raise is a profitable one, and Joe laughed. Of what is this fine crop to consist, ma'am? Boys, I want to open a school for little lads, a good, happy, home-like school with me to take care of them and Fritz to teach them. That's a true joy and plain for you. Isn't that just like her? cried Laurie, appealing to the family, who looked as much surprised as he. I like it, said Mrs. Mush decidedly. So do I, added her husband, who welcomed the thought of a chance for trying the Socratic method of education on modern youth. It will be an immense care for Joe, said Meg, stroking the head of her one all-absorbing son. Joe can do it, and be happy in it. It's a splendid idea. Tell us all about it, cried Mr. Lawrence, who had been longing to lend the lovers a hand, but knew that they would refuse his help. I knew you'd stand by me, sir. Amy does too. I see it in her eyes, though she prudently waits to turn it over in her mind before she speaks. Now, my dear people, continued Joe earnestly, just understand that this isn't a new idea of mine. But the long-cherished plan, before my Fritz came, I used to think how, when I made my fortune, and no one needed me at home, I'd hire a big house and pick up some poor, forlorn little lads, who hadn't any mothers, and take care of them, and make life jolly for them before it was too late. I see so many going to ruin for want of help at the right minute. I love so to do anything for them. I seem to feel their wants and sympathize with their troubles. And, oh, I should like to be a mother to them. Mrs. March held out her hand to Joe, who took it, smiling with tears in her eyes, and went on in the old enthusiastic way, which they had not seen for a long time. I told my plan to Fritz once, and he said it was just what he would like and agreed to try it when we got rich. Bless his dear heart, he's been doing it all his life. Helping poor boys, I mean, not getting rich, that he will never be. Money doesn't stay in his pocket long enough to lay up any. But now, thanks to my good old aunt, 
who loved me better than I ever deserved. I am rich, at least I feel so. And we can live at Plumfield perfectly well, if we have a flourishing school. It's just the place for boys. The house is big, and the furniture strong and plain. There's plenty of room for dozens inside, and splendid grounds outside. They could help in the garden and orchard. Such work is healthy, isn't it, sir? Then Fritz could train and teach in his own way, and father will help him. I can feed and nurse and pet and scold them, and mother will be my standby. I've always longed for lots of boys, and never had enough. Now I can fill the house full, and revel in the little dears, to my heart's content. Think what luxury, Plumfield my own, and the wilderness of boys to enjoy it with me. As Jo waved her hands and gave a sigh of rapture, the family went off into a gale of merriment, and Mr. Lawrence laughed till they thought he'd have an apoplectic fit. I don't see anything funny, she said gravely, when she could be heard. Nothing could be more natural and proper than for my professor to open a school, and for me to prefer to reside in my own estate. She is putting on airs already, said Laurie, who regarded the idea in the light of a capital joke. But may I inquire how you intend to support the establishment, if all the pupils are little ragamuffins? I'm afraid your crop won't be profitable in a worldly sense, Mrs. Bayer. Now don't be a wet blanket, Teddy. Of course I shall have rich pupils also. Perhaps begin with such altogether. Then, when I've got a start, I can take in a ragamuffin or two. Just for a relish. Rich people's children often need care and comfort, as well as poor. I've seen unfortunate little creatures left to servants, or backward ones pushed forward, when it's real cruelty. Some are naughty through mismanagement or neglect, and some lose their mothers. Besides, the best have to get through the hobbledehoy age, and that's the very time they need most patience and kindness. People laugh at them and hustle them about, try to keep them out of sight, and expect them to turn all at once from pretty children into fine young men. They don't complain much, plucky little souls, but they feel it. I've been through something of it, and I know all about it. I have a special interest in such young bears, and like to show them that I see the warm, honest, well-meaning boys' hearts in spite of the clumsy arms and legs and topsy-turvy heads. I've had experience, too, for haven't I brought up one boy to be a pride and honor to his family? I'll testify that you tried to do it, said Laurie, with a grateful look. And I've succeeded beyond my hopes, for here you are, a steady, sensible businessman, doing heaps of good with your money. And laying up the blessings of the poor instead of dollars. But you are not merely a businessman. You love good and beautiful things, enjoy them yourselves, and let others go halves, as you always did in the old times. I am proud of you, Teddy, for you get better every year, and everyone feels it, though you won't let them say so. Yes, and when I have my flock, I will just point to you and say, There's your model, my lads. Poor Laurie didn't know where to look, for, man though he was, something of the old bashfulness came over him as this burst of praise made all faces turn approvingly upon him. I say, Joe, that's rather too much, he began, just in his old boyish way. You have all done more for me than I can ever thank you for, except by doing my best not to disappoint you. You have rather cast me off lately, Joe, but I've had the best of help, nevertheless. So, if I've got on at all, you may thank these two for it. And he laid one hand gently on his grandfather's head, and the other on Amy's golden one. For the three were never far apart. 
I do think that families are the most beautiful things in all the world, burst out Joe, who was in an unusually uplifted frame of mind just then. When I have one of my own, I hope it will be as happy as the three I know and love the best. If John and my Fritz were only here, it would be quite a little heaven on earth, she added more quietly. And that night, when she went to her room after a blissful evening of family councils, hopes and plans, her heart was so full of happiness that she could only calm it by kneeling beside the empty bed, always near her own, and thinking tender thoughts of Beth. It was a very astonishing year altogether, for things seemed to happen in an unusually rapid and delightful manner. Almost before she knew where she was, Jo found herself married and settled at Plumfield. Then a family of six or seven boys sprung up like mushrooms, and flourished surprisingly, poor boys as well as rich, for Mr. Lawrence was continually finding some touching case of destitution, and begging the bears to take pity on the child, and he would gladly pay a trifle for its support. In this way, the shy old gentleman got round proud Joe and furnished her with the style of boy in which she most delighted. Of course, it was uphill work at first. And Joe made her queer mistakes, but the wise professor steered her safely into calmer waters, and the most rampant ragamuffin was conquered in the end. How Joe did enjoy her wilderness of boys! and how poor dear Aunt March would have lamented had she been there to see the sacred precincts of Prem, well-ordered Plumfield overrun with Toms, Dicks, and Harrys. There was a sort of poetic justice about it after all, for the old lady had been the terror of the boys for miles around, and now the exiles feasted freely on forbidden plums, kicked up the gravel with profane boots unreproved, and played cricket in the big field where the irritable cow with a crumpled horn used to invite rash youths to come and be tossed. It became a sort of boy's paradise, and Laurie suggested that it should be called the Bear Garden, as a compliment to its master and appropriate to its inhabitants. It never was a fashionable school, and the professor did not lay up a fortune. But it was just what Joe intended it to be, a happy, home-like place for boys, who needed teaching, care, and kindness. Every room in the big house was soon full. Every little plot in the garden soon had its owner. A regular menagerie appeared in the barn, and shed for pet animals were allowed, and three times a day Jo smiled at her frets from the head of a long table lined on either side with rows of happy young faces, which all turned to her with affectionate eyes, confiding words and grateful hearts, full of love for Mother Bear. She had boys enough now, and did not tire of them, though they were not angels by any means, and some of them caused both Professor and Professorin much trouble and anxiety. But her faith in the good spot which exists in the heart of the naughtiest, sauciest, most tantalizing little ragamuffin gave her patience, skill, and in time success, for no mortal boy could hold out long with Father Bear shining on him as benevolently as the sun and the mother bear for giving him seventy times seven. Very precious to Joe was the friendship of the lads, the penitent sniffs and whispers of the wrongdoing, their droll or touching little confidences, their pleasant enthusiasms, hopes and plans, even their misfortunes, for they only endeared them to her all the more. There were slow boys and bashful boys, feeble boys and riotous boys, boys that lisped and boys that stuttered, one or two lame ones, 
and a merry little quadroon, who could not be taken in elsewhere, but who was welcome to the bear garden, though some people predicted that his admission would ruin the school. Yes, Jo was a very happy woman there, in spite of hard work, much anxiety, and perpetual racket. She enjoyed it heartily, and found the applause of her boys more satisfying than any praise of the world. For now she told no stories except to her flock of enthusiastic believers and admirers. As the years went on, two little lads of her own came to increase her happiness. Rob, named for Grandpa, and Teddy, a happy-go-lucky baby who seemed to have inherited his papa's sunshiny temper, as well as his mother's lively spirit. How they ever grew up alive in that whirlpool of boys was a mystery to their grandma and aunts, but they flourished like dandelions in spring, and the rough nurses loved and served them well. And there were a great many holidays at Plumfield, and one of the most delightful was the yearly apple picking. For then, the marches, Lawrences, Brooks, and Bears turned out in full force, and made a day of it. Five years after Joe's wedding, one of these fruitful festivals occurred, a mellow October day, when the air was full of an exhilarating freshness, which made the spirits rise and the blood dance healthily in the veins. The old orchard wore its holiday attire, goldenrod and asters fringed the mossy walls, grasshoppers skipped briskly in the serene grass, and crickets chirped like fairy pipers at a feast. Squirrels were busy with their small harvesting, birds twittered their adieu from the alders in the lane and every tree stood ready to send down its shower of red or yellow apples at the first shake. Everybody was there. Everybody laughed and sang, climbed up and tumbled down. Everybody declared that there never had been such a perfect day or such a jolly set to enjoy it. And everyone gave themselves up to the simple pleasure of the hour as freely as if there was no such things as care or sorrow in the world. Mr. March strolled placidly about, quoting Tassa, Cowley, and Columella to Mr. Lawrence while enjoying the gentle apple's winy juice. The professor charged up and down the green aisles like a stout Teutonic knight, with a pole for a lance, leading on the boys, who made a hook and ladder company of themselves, and performed wonders in the way of ground and lofty tumbling. Laurie devoted himself to the little ones, wrote his small daughter in a bushel basket, took Daisy up among the birds' nests, and kept adventurous Rob from breaking his neck. Mrs. March and Meg sat among the apple piles like a pair of pomonas, sorting the contributions that kept pouring in, while Amy, with a beautiful motherly expression in her face, sketched the various groups and watched over one pale lad, who sat adoring her with his little crutch beside him. Jo was in her element that day, and rushed about, with her gown pinned up, and her hat anywhere but on her head. And her baby tucked under her arm, ready for any lively adventure which might turn up. Little Teddy bore a charmed life, for nothing ever happened to him, and Joe never felt any anxiety when he was whisked up into a tree by one lad, galloped off on the back of another, or supplied with sour russets by his indulging papa who labored under the Germanic delusion that babies could digest anything, from pickled cabbage to buttons, nails, and their own small shoes. She knew that little Ted would turn up again in time, safe and rosy, dirty and serene, and as always receive him back with a hearty welcome, for Joe loved her babies tenderly.
At four o'clock a lull took place, and baskets remained empty, while the apple pickers rested and compared rents and bruises. Then Joe and Meg, with a detachment of the bigger boys, set forth the supper on the grass, for an out-of-door tea was always the crowning joy of the day. The land literally flowed with milk and honey on such occasions, for the lads were not required to sit at table, but allowed to partake of refreshments as they liked, freedom being the sauce best beloved by the boyish soul. They availed themselves of the rare privilege to the fullest extent. For some tried the pleasing experiment of drinking milk while standing on their hands. Others lent a charm to leapfrog by eating pie in the pauses of the game. Cookies were sown broadcast over the field, and apple turnovers roosted in the trees like a new style of bird. The little girls had a private tea party, and Ted roved among the edibles at his own sweet will. When no one could eat any more, the professor proposed the first regular toast, which was always drunk at such times. Aunt March, God bless her. A toast heartily given by the good man, who never forgot how much he owed her, and quietly drunk by the boys who had been taught to keep her memory green. Now, Grandma's sixtieth birthday. Long life to her, with three times three. That was given with a will, as you may well believe, and, the cheering once begun, it was hard to stop it. Everybody's health was proposed, from patron to the astonished guinea pig who had strayed from its proper sphere in search of its young master. Demi, as the oldest grandchild, then presented to the queen of the day, with various gifts so numerous that they were transported to the festive scene in a wheelbarrow. Funny presents, some of them, but what would have been defects to other eyes were ornaments to grandmas, for the children's gifts were all their own. Every stitch Daisy's patient little fingers had put into the handkerchiefs she hemmed was better than embroidery to Mrs. March. Demi's miracle of mechanical skill, though the cover wouldn't shut. Rob's footstool had a wiggle in its uneven legs that she declared was soothing, and no page of the costly book Amy's child gave her was so fair as that on which appeared in tipsy capitals the words to dear Grandma from her little bath. During the ceremony, the boys had mysteriously disappeared, and when Mrs. March had tried to thank her children and broke down, while Teddy wiped her eyes on his pinafore, the professor suddenly began to sing. Then, from above him, voice after voice took up the words, and from tree to tree echoed the music of the unseen choir as the boys sang with all their hearts the little song that Joe had written. And Laurie set to music, and the professor trained his lads to give with the best effect. This was something altogether new, and it proved a grand success, for Mrs. March couldn't get over her surprise, and insisted on shaking hands with every one of the featherless birds. From tall Franz and Emil to the little quadroon, who had the sweetest voice of all. After this, the boys dispersed for a final lark, leaving Mrs. March and her daughters under the festival tree. I don't think I ever ought to call myself Unlucky Joe again, when my greatest wish has been so beautifully gratified, said Mrs. Bear taking Teddy's little fist out of the milk pitcher, in which he was rapturously churning. And yet your life is very different from the one you pictured so long ago. Do you remember your castles in the air? asked Amy, smiling as she watched Laurie and John playing cricket with the boys. Dear fellows, it does my heart good to see them forget business and frolic for a day, answered Joe who now spoke in a maternal way of all mankind. 
Yes, I remember. But the life I wanted then seems selfish, lonely, and cold to me now. I haven't given up the hope that I may write a good book yet, but I can wait. And I'm sure it will be all the better for such experiences and illustrations as these. And Joe pointed from the lively lads in the distance to her father, leaning on the professor's arm as they walked to and fro in the sunshine, deep in one of the conversations which both enjoyed so much, and then to her mother, sitting enthroned among her daughters, with their children in her lap and at her feet, as if all found help and happiness in the face which never could grow old to them. My castle was the most nearly realized of all. I asked for splendid things, to be sure, but in my heart I knew I should be satisfied if I had a little home and John, and some dear children like these. I've got them all, thank God, and am the happiest woman in the world. And Meg laid her hand on her tall boy's head, with a face full of tender and devout content. My castle is very different from what I planned, but I would not alter it, though, like Joe, I don't relinquish all my artistic hopes, or confine myself to helping others fulfill the dreams of beauty. I've begun to model a figure of baby, and Laurie says it is the best thing I've ever done. I think so myself, and mean to do it in marble so that, whatever happens, it may at least keep the image of my little angel. As Amy spoke, a great tear dropped on the golden hair of the sleeping child in her arms, for her one well-beloved daughter was a frail little creature, and the dread of losing her was the shadow over Amy's sunshine. This cross was doing much for both father and mother, for one love and sorrow bound them closely together. Amy's nature was growing sweeter, deeper, and more tender. Laurie was growing more serious, strong, and firm, and both were learning that beauty, youth, good fortune, even love itself, cannot keep care and pain, loss and sorrow, from the most blessed. For into each life some rain must fall, some days must be dark and sad and dreary. She is growing better, I am sure of it, my dear. Don't despond, but hope and keep happy, said Mrs. March, as tender-hearted Daisy stooped from her knee to lay her rosy cheek against her little cousin's pale one. I never ought to while I have you to cheer me up, Marmy, and Laurie to take more than half of every burden, replied Amy warmly. He never lets me see his anxiety, but is so sweet and patient with me, so devoted to Beth, and such a stay and comfort to me always, that I can't love him enough. So, in spite of my one cross, I can say with Meg, thank God I'm a happy woman. There's no need for me to say it, for everyone can see that I am far happier than I deserve, added Joe, glancing from her good husband to her chubby children, tumbling on the grass beside her. Fritz is getting grey and stout. I am growing as thin as a shadow, and am thirty. We never shall be rich, and Plumfield may burn up any night for that incorrigible Tommy Banks will smoke sweet fern cigars under the bedclothes, though he set himself afire three times already. But in spite of these unromantic facts, I have nothing to complain of, and never was so jolly in my life. Excuse the remark, but living among boys, I can't help using their expressions now and then. Yes, Joe, I think your harvest will be a good one, began Mrs. March, frightening away a big black cricket that was staring Teddy out of countenance. Not half so good as yours, mother. Here it is, and we never can thank you enough for the patient sowing and reaping you have done, cried Joe, with the loving impetuosity which she never would outgrow. I hope there will be more wheat and fewer tares every year, 
said Amy softly. A large sheaf, but I know there's room in your heart for it, mommy dear, added Meg's tender voice. Touched to the heart, Mrs. March could only stretch out her arms, as if to gather children and grandchildren to herself, and say, with face and voice full of motherly love, gratitude, and humility, Oh, my girls, however long you may live, I never can wish you a greater happiness than this.